Hello, everyone. I'm Evo Dalder, president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review, our weekly look at news from around the world. And joining us this week from Washington, D.C., Nahal Tusi, who is the senior foreign affairs correspondent at Politico. Nahal, great to have you get back again. Great to be here. Also joining us uh, this time from Washington, D.C. is Nirmal Ghosh, who is the uh, Washington Bureau Chief of the Strait Times from Singapore. Nirmal, wonderful to have you back safely. I know you were in Singapore just last week, so great to have you back here in the States. Nice to be back. Thank you. And from London, Gideon Rahman, Senior uh, Chief Foreign Affairs Columnist for the Financial Times. Gideon, as always, great to see you as well. Lot, lots of things to talk about this week, uh, starting off with uh, a new variant in COVID and COVID being back uh, really in the news and dominating the news. Also with us are uh, talks with Iran uh, to see if we can get back into the nuclear agreement. Uh, we have a major crisis brewing uh, on the Ukrainian border uh, with Russian military activity there. And of course, next week, the Summit for Democracies. We're going to talk about all of that. Let's start with COVID and uh, this very, very dangerous variant that seems to have emerged uh, just in the past week near Mal uh, from, uh, from Africa. What we think that's where it started, but we don't know. It's already in 26 countries. Uh, Omicron uh, and, of course, rising COVID levels all through the Northern Hemisphere, in particular Europe, uh, as well as uh, in the United States and other parts. Um, Nirmal, bring us up to date about where we are with uh, the virus and what some of the big issues uh, are that, uh, that have come up because uh, of this new variant uh, springing, uh, coming, coming out of uh, the woodwork, so to say, uh, and, and really uh, throwing another wrench into our recovery. Right. So at least 26 countries, as you said, have now reported cases, and that number will grow. I mean, there are more signs of community transmission, which means this virus is out and about. And unfortunately, it will always be associated with Africa. And that, to me, raises the issue of vaccine inequity. If you look at Africa across the continent, about 10.4% of the population has received one dose of a vaccine. Compare, compare that to uh, North America, it's 64% for fully vaccinated in North America. And in Europe, it's 62% fully vaccinated. And we know variants can occur anywhere and variants will emerge. This one may have been in Europe, in fact, before it was detected in South Africa. But what we do know for sure is a large unvaccinated population creates conditions conducive to the emergence. And of course, it goes without saying to the spread of a variant such as this. And if you look at the vaccination map, Africa is like the forgotten continent. According to the New York Times tracker, about 74% of shots in arms globally have been in high and upper middle income countries. Less than 1% have been administered in low income countries. So it's pretty stark. And from my perspective, this is also a lesson to Asia. Myanmar is one area of obvious concern. The country is in conflict. The economy is sinking, a full vaccination rate of less than 20%. India's vaccination rate is 32% fully vaccinated. Indonesia, 35%. So there's a lot of room over there also for more variants to emerge. Now, vaccine diplomacy may help. The U.S. has pledged 1.1 billion doses through next year for developing countries, and China's President Xi Jinping pledged 600 million doses with an, an addition 400 million, so total a billion, a billion for Africa. But it's not as simple as just jumping vaccines. Some are not short on vaccines but lack the capacity to roll them out. Vaccines need specific refrigeration conditions, specific syringes. That whole chain has to be functioning. And separately, there's this battle over a temporary waiver of the TRIPS agreement for vaccines. That's trade-related intellectual property rights. And this is being stalled in the WTO. The ministers were set to meet in Geneva this week, but because of the new wave in Western Europe, that's, that was postponed. And the countries, I believe, I'm told, doing most of the stalling are apparently Germany, Switzerland, and the UK. And then we come to the response. Of course, there were immediate travel bans. The US led the way. But these bans are just really speed bumps in the way of the variant, buying time, really, as we figure out how serious this is. Preliminary data does show this variant is very contagious, more so than Delta. But, and again, this is so far because it is still early. The symptoms in fully vaccinated people appear to be mild. But governments are not able to find a balance somewhere between legitimate caution, let's say caution 1.0 and alarmism 5.0, 
and still encourage people, encourage businesses and keep the economy humming. So max vaccine mandates are one way. Again, so far as we know, that those who are fully vaccinated and have this new variant have only mild symptoms. On a final note, the media, I'm sorry to say, I get the feeling the media often does not help by sort of breathlessly pushing out headlines on every new case detected of the variant. And it has to be done, it is news, but it should be done in a way that does not fuel panic. Who has the variant affected? What are their circumstances? How are they doing? That may be the real story. And a final point, and this is a, one I've been ranting about for some time, there is not going to be a post COVID world. There just isn't going to be one. And we have yet to get our heads around this. Uh, Nirmal, I, I think all, all uh, really excellent points and, and just showing in some ways, Gideon, that two years into this crisis, we don't really haven't learned a lot of lessons uh, in terms of how governments are reacting. I mean, one of the most striking things that, that Nirmal mentioned was uh, governments taking a national approach to how to solve this by shutting their borders and having uncoordinated uh, policies on testing, on travel, on uh, even on vaccination and on uh, who who should be masked and who shouldn't and where. And uh, oh. you'd think two years later, we'd all be kind of on the same page. We'd all sort of have the same uh, uh, science and same views. And yet it doesn't seem to happen. No, absolutely not. I mean, I think if anything, the divergence is, is widening. I mean, even here in Europe, I mean, I, I think uh, like a lot of people, I've begun to travel again. But every time I go to a European country, I have to check, well, what's the regulations for the Netherlands? What are they for Holland? What are they for Italy, France? It's different in every place. And these are all members of the European Union. Um, you know, so I'm, I think, going to, to the Netherlands on Sunday. Um, but, you know, I was in Switzerland last week, and this week it would be impossible because the Swiss have, have closed their borders, you know, but their neighbors haven't. Um, but I think the biggest divergence, the most interesting one to me, is between China and the rest of the world, because China is still pursuing a zero COVID policy, which is essentially stealing it off from the rest of the world. Unless you really intend to spend, you know, half a year or something in China, you just won't go because you've got to uh, quarantine very strictly for three weeks, um, four if you want to go into Beijing. Um, and Chinese people aren't traveling either uh, because it's so hard for them to get back into their own country because they too are covered by these um, these regulations. And the result is that um, while the Western world has a very high death toll, which is, of course, why the Chinese are not opening up, they say, you know, who are you to lecture us? America's had over 700,000, getting up to 800,000 deaths. You know, China officially has, has, has had less than 5,000. But they are, they're, they're just kind of sealing themselves off from the world. And I try to figure out what the economic uh, and geopolitical consequences of that will be. I mean, Xi Jinping has not met another foreign leader since March 20, uh, 29, 2020, I think, yeah. Um, no, I, I, I think uh, sort of reinforcing a nationalist perspective uh, in a world that is, as we, we, we see, even if you have travel restrictions, you can't keep a pandemic uh, within certain borders. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's fascinating, uh, uh, Nahal, that this lack of sort of coordination that seems to be there and you know, I would I'd, I'd like to say the lack of leadership by anybody, including the United States, which uh, under under President Biden, uh, one would have said America is back, America is taking its rightful place at the head of the table. But when it comes to this issue, uh, yes, vaccines have been promised, the 1.1 billion, but I think only 10% of those actually have flown uh, out of the country uh, into into other countries. Uh, uh, than that has been promised. So how are we going to get the kind of coordination and cooperation that is necessary to deal with uh, a crisis that is this global and affects us all one way or the other? Um, well, look, if I knew that, I would like run everything, right? I mean, <laughs> um, I think if you, you know, if you talk to people in the administration, I think they will tell you a few things. First is that, you know, they were handed very little to work with from the previous administration. They feel extremely frustrated by that. Um, secondly, um, they do feel like other nations need to step up a little more in terms of what they're willing to give uh, to the less developed countries and things like that. So there's a couple of these elements floating out there. I, you know, what was striking me was I was going back and reading some of my coverage from like 2020 and 
all of this like has been predicted. I mean, this is what's driving me crazy is this vaccine nationalism thing. I wrote a story about it in like May of 2020 saying people are really worried that, you know, the, the, um, you know, developed countries are going to hoard this stuff. And, and then this, uh, uh, virus is just going to boomerang and change and just never go away. I mean, we, we were all predicting this. And I think one of, one of the things that struck me as I was thinking about this last night was, you know, I think at the time, everybody thought we would have more time before we got the vaccine. So there was a sense in corners, I think, especially among the NGOs and, you know, the Gates Foundation people, like, well, we have more time to get out the the information and, and, and the call to countries to say, hey, you need to have a better system for distributing the vaccine for everybody. But, you know, blessedly, the vaccine was discovered a lot sooner than people expected. So I think that actually scrambled timelines as well. And so that's another reason, even though it's a good thing we have a vaccine sooner, it's another reason that maybe we didn't, as, as a you know planetary community, have a really good thought out process into how we're going to distribute all this stuff. I think it's a good point. Things went and moved very quickly, but you know, it's a year since we since vaccines uh, starting, literally a year, uh, starting to become available. Uh, first, of course, in the UK and then in the US. Uh, and the Biden administration has been in power now since almost a year, since January twentieth. And you'd think that issues like testing, uh, uh, like uh, regimes, like uh, better cooperation would and, and distribution that both you and Nirmal pointed out. Uh, would would have been resolved, but but Nirmal, uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem to be that anyone, frankly, is is looking at uh, at these issues beyond maybe the WHO and some of the NGOs, uh, particularly the issue that you mentioned. Uh, how do you overcome not just availability but distribution uh, and 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 getting uh, uh, shots into people's arms? I note that in in uh, in South Africa, uh, they 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 uh, re rejected a shipment of vaccines because. Uh, vaccine hesitancy and lack of distribution problems uh, were making it uh, difficult to actually take the vaccines and getting into people's uh, arms. Uh, what what strategies are you hearing people talking about to address that sort of fundamental issue, not just availability, but distribution and uh, and vaccination itself? Yeah, in the Philippines, apparently, I was told that in the Philippines, they apparently ran out with syringes to, uh, to administer one batch of vaccines, and this was a complete waste. Um, so the U.S. has uh, promised some money to developing countries for precisely this logistics and whatnot. Uh, China, in its uh, in its pledge uh, of one billion to Africa, was, is also including one thousand five hundred public health care specialists, which it will send to Africa. So uh, one, I think now there is with this new. The, the one thing good about panic is it focuses the mind, right? That's the only good thing. And there is a bit of an awareness now with this new variant that something needs to be done to step up uh, on, on all these large pools of unvaccinated people to sort of minimize the space in which this virus can move around and circulate and further mutate. So I suspect that there will be um, a slight improvement in, 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 in that, uh, on that front. But again, it's, it's trying to catch up, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit late in the day. And meanwhile, we still have to do this balancing act. Governments and you know, uh, state governments, national governments have to do this balancing act, how to keep the, the economies uh, happening. Because what you're going to see in uh, South Africa now is livelihoods destroyed, uh, uh, you know, lockdowns and whatnot. I, mean, I would also argue, you could say it's a bit of a stretch, but I, will, I would also argue that it is not in the strategic interest of say the European Union, to allow this to happen in Africa, because if Africa as a continent, and of course there are vast disparities in the continent, but generally, very broadly speaking, if the economy, if the economies sink further, that will create more distress migration. So it is in the, it's in the interest of, of Europe, certainly, and the rest of the world to make sure that you know, Africa is, is finally paid some attention to. It's a central conundrum, I think, in world politics uh, uh, near Mal, and I think Gideon and, and, and Holly also to, to touched on, on, on this issue, that it, you know, the reality is cooperation is the only way to deal with these issues, whether it's on the economic side, whether on the pandemic side, climate change, we haven't even talked about, of course, different issue. And yet we find that nations find it extremely difficult to do so. Uh, and this tension uh, that, that I think Gideon sort of emphasized with the Chinese taking the, a, a completely different approach 
uh, with impacts that we don't really know yet uh, geopolitically, let alone geoeconomically, by cutting themselves off from the rest of the world uh, in this way, at least in a social in a social setting, uh, uh, is is important. We'll come back to this. The issue of the virus is not going away, unfortunately. Uh, um, but uh, let's uh, let's switch over uh, Nihal to um, uh, to uh, Iran. Uh, nuclear talks. Uh, uh, finally, this week, uh, the uh, the various parties to the JCPOA, uh, the nuclear agreement that was signed in 2015, got together uh, with the United States again in its side room because, of course, the U.S. left the agreement in 2018, uh, trying to find a way back. Uh, how did this first week go, and where do you think it's going? Uh, well, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but every time the Iran nuclear deal stuff comes up, like, I feel like I'm having an existential crisis. Like, I start asking questions like, why? What is the point? What is the meaning of all this? Like, it's it's just wild, right? This is this was the seventh round this week. It happened after a five-month hiatus during which Iran got a new uh, civilian government, um, well, you know, government, uh, that is much more hardline than the previous one. And so the new government comes in. Um, after, again, months off, and they have all sorts of maximalist demands, including demanding that the United States remove all of the sanctions, even the non-nuclear ones, that were reimposed by Trump when he withdrew from the deal in 2018. Now, and they also want Biden to promise that none of his successors will ever revoke the deal again, which is something he can't do. Neither of these things can he do. And my understanding after a week of discussions is that Basically, there hasn't been much movement um, and that the Europeans who are facilitating these talks between the U.S. and Iran um, say, you know, they, they are getting increasingly frustrated with the Iranians uh, because the Iranians want to go back and, you know, renegotiate aspects of the talks that happened months ago um, in a significant way that the U.S. is going to see it's going to deem unacceptable. So basically, it's. I'm not. I'm not sure. It's not just that we've made no progress. I think we actually might have regressed uh, this week. They are expecting to get back together next week once again in Vienna for an eighth round. Um, but I, I just, you know, I'm not a betting person. But if I was, like, I would not bet that this deal um, is revived anytime soon. Gideon, what are you hearing uh, from your sources in London? Of course, the Europeans. Uh, and particularly the French, the Germans, and the, uh, and the Brits have been at the center of this effort now for a, a decade. Uh, they led the, uh, or a decade, more than a decade, they led the early uh, effort to negotiate and, of course, have been at the table and are parties to this agreement and really wanted to uh, stick with the agreement uh, after Donald Trump left. And yet they're stuck with the reality of, of a, a U.S. that is interested in coming back, but is not going to come back uh, for nothing. And uh, in Iran, that it's not clear that they want to come back or if they want to come back, the price for coming back uh, is very high. So how do how do you how do folks in London see this? Well, I mean, I, I think you're right. It, it's, it's an area where it's one of the few areas, actually, where the U.K., France and Germany continue to work quite closely together. For historic reasons, I wouldn't say it's um, top of the agenda in in any of those countries. I mean, Ukraine, which we're going to talk about in a moment, is I think uh, top of mind at the moment. Which is not to say that it it couldn't flare up into a crisis really quite easily. Um, you know, when I was in Israel was a couple of uh, weeks ago, a uh, month now, um, the Israelis had a sort of slightly kind of complex uh, messaging, I suppose, because on the one hand they were saying you know, Iran will cross a threshold very soon. And that, uh, as we were hearing, it's a very hardline government, not one that's amenable to, to negotiation. And all that pointed to the risk of conflict. On the other hand, the Israelis weren't, although what they were saying sounded like, you know, they were on the point of bombing, the sort of body language didn't suggest that, if you know what I mean. It didn't, it didn't feel like a country that was gearing itself up for war, whatever the formal nature of the briefing. So it was hard to know exactly where they were coming from. But I think that their analysis that this current Iranian government is, you know, going to play hardball, to put it politely, was clearly correct. And, and you know, the Europeans are kind of caught in the middle. So as you say, for, for a period, you know, back in the Trump administration, all the problems were coming from the United States, as, as far as it was seen from European capitals. And now that they have a more reasonable seeming American government, uh, they're faced with the intransigence in Tehran. Um, 
uh, and this sense that well maybe Iran is um, decided to to get much much closer to the line and maybe even cross it. Uh, and uh, and Yermal, I think I think that's uh, uh, if for the moment everybody is just I guess going through the motions. But you heard uh, Secretary Blinken say yesterday that. Uh, we would have to come to the end of this, uh, whether there is a, a solution to this or not, uh, very soon. And he then emphasized that when he, what he meant by very soon was uh, uh, one or two days. Uh, uh, this thing can all of a sudden really start to dominate everything that is happening. Isn't that right? Uh, and, and, and sort of uh, push away everything that, uh, that is out there. Uh, and, 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 and become the number one issue because an Iran that is no longer constrained uh, and developing its nuclear weapons in the way it is, a nuclear capability in the way it is, uh, is a danger, uh, will be seen as a danger by many. Yes, absolutely. It has the potential to accelerate pretty fast, especially as, uh, you know, Gideon was saying, although, although no one really ever wants to go to war, on, uh, but Israel is fully capable of taking unilateral action to stop Iran from developing, uh, uh, from weaponizing. But, um, you know, the US is caught in the sanctions trap again, right? I mean, we've seen again and again, you sanction a country and you can sort of bring an economy down to its knees and so forth, but you rarely change the mindset. Um, Iranians are not gonna start loving the US because, because sanctions are lifted or, or anything like that. I mean, this is seen as an existential issue for Iran, right? So it will go to, so these, these negotiations are going to be painful. And if I were to predict anything, which is sort of a foolish undertaking, but I would say, yes, there would be some relaxation of sanctions and, and, and then it will just continue to sort of plod on, but with no real resolution and no change to the Iran's goal, which is to eventually, yes, weaponize and, you know, be a nuclear power. Look at North Korea. They're not going to give up nuclear weapons once they have them, right? So everybody, it's, it's, it's a bit simplistic, but everybody wants to be like that. Everybody wants to have a nuclear weapon, so nobody else will be able to mess with you, right? That's as basic as it gets, especially in the context of, of Iran and the rest of the Middle East. So I don't, uh, I'm not very optimistic. I am optimistic that they'll find some way to stave off uh, a sudden acceleration and escalation as which you, which you mentioned, but uh, I'm not optimistic that the, the fundamental issue will be addressed anytime soon. Now, I'll just uh, ba back to you uh, to, to uh, you said you weren't a batting person, so I'm not gonna put you on the spot there, but there seems to be uh, a, a, a political limit to what the administration can do if it isn't completely returning to the JCPOA's terms uh, exactly as they were in 2015. Uh, uh, talk of sort of uh, a little here by the Iranians giving a little uh, by the U.S. Uh, my, my sense is politically that will become very hard for the Biden administration. What do you hear them talking about? And of course, what do you hear on the other side? Uh, worries of the administration, in fact, taking those limited steps just to postpone uh, the moment of, uh, uh, of having to face the reality of what Nirmal talked about. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of different things that are, you know, rumored and discussed. One is this idea of having an interim deal, you know, some sanctions relief or some rollbacks in the Iranian uh, program. The sense is that's not, that neither side really wants that and that's not gonna happen. Um, there's talk of, you know, plan B, nobody really knows what that means. Uh, but the idea being that like, if the Iranians won't agree to the terms to return, uh, that the US will essentially continue what's maximum pressure and maybe like beef that up by again, adding more sanctions, doing more to rally allies around the world, that sort of thing, you know, or, but their preference, the U.S.'s preference is still uh, to return to the JCPOA. Um, and, you know, so they're still plotting along. And I honestly, I don't know if they exactly know what they're going to do. I think this is very much, you know, like a day-to-day, -day, like how can we, you know, map this versus that? Uh, I, I think they are still to some extent, um, you know, figuring this out as they go along. Um, and I think, you know, Iran gets a vote on this. Uh, so it's important to remember, remember that. But one other thing I want to point out that not a lot of people like rem remember, but is important. There's this uh, Congress passed the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act a few years ago. 
And that act says that any new agreement that the U.S. reaches with Iran related to its program, is su- its nuclear program, is subject to congressional review. And there are lawmakers in the Republican Party and, and beyond that, say, that are saying that even if we agree with Iran to return to the JCPOA, that arguably that is subject to congressional approval. Like that's a new type of agreement. And so that's another you know, factor to think about in the days ahead, whether lawmakers are gonna try to step in and have a say in that sense. Um, and again, you know, next year, the midterms as well. So it, as the months go by, it's gonna be much harder for Biden uh, to make any sort of compromises. And that's why a lot of people are actually really frustrated with him because they feel like he could have handled this in the first two months of his presidency if he had just lifted the relevant sanctions and returned to the JCPOA and you know, struck a quick deal with the Iranian regime that existed at the time. Well, uh, we look forward, so we can't look back. Uh, uh, I think there is, there is merit to the argument that sometimes moving quickly and rapidly, uh, even in the face of known political criticism, gets you, gets you more than trying to do it uh, uh, deliberately as, as we're, we've been trying to do with the uh, Iran nuclear negotiations. So, We'll get back to this issue too, because I, I think one thing is for sure, it's not gonna be resolved anytime soon. And if it is, by the way, we'll have a good conversation about that. In the meantime, I uh, uh, wanna shift to uh, Gideon to, to Ukraine, uh, Russia, NATO. Uh, uh, this was the week uh, when I think things started to clarify uh, in, in many ways. We've had rumblings and of course, uh, major uh, military buildups for quite a while now uh, in the region. Uh, but major speeches by uh, President Putin, uh, a meeting of NATO foreign ministers for a couple of days, a meeting between Tony Blinken and Lavrov, uh, the foreign minister of, of Russia, uh, all seems to kind of clarify where, uh, where this is. And then how does that clarify things, uh, uh, Gideon? Where are we on this issue? Uh, and, and, and how do you think it's, it's evolving? Well, I'm glad you think there's clarity because, I mean, I can certainly see there's um, a lot of noise. I'm not sure I can sort of pick up the signal from the noise, if you like. Um, I'd be interested to hear what you think as a former NATO ambassador. But um, I, look, it seems to me that the West has been signaling for some time now that it is very alarmed by this Russian military buildup. And that, as far as I can figure out, they... Um, it's not just the fact of the buildup. They also have some kind of read on Russian intent. And I think that they think there is serious consideration in Russia of a military escalation, uh, you know, further incursions into, into Ukraine. And for, indeed, um, you know, Lloyd Austin referred to that possibility just this week. I think he said the best case was that we could avoid another incur- Russian incursion into Ukraine. So uh, there's also been talk, as you know, of a potentially Russian-sponsored coup, so our side um, thinks that Putin has decided for whatever reason to ramp things up again. Uh, there's a lot of uh, pe- people will direct you to go and look at the um, long essay that Putin wrote uh, in July about the historic ties between Russia and Ukraine, which basically portray the current situation as a historic injustice, as a threat to Russia, as something that the whole logic of the article is this has to be put right. It can't uh, can't go on like this. Um, so there's a case being made for war, if you like. The question is whether um, we can do enough to deter him and whether we even know what it is we're going to do. Um, and I think that, you know, the weakness in the Western position is that nobody really believes that we'll fight over this. Um, and I don't think uh, so we're left threatening economic sanctions or some of which you know uh, we as you said with the west does this a lot so we're just saying well we'll intensify them and there are some economic uh, weapons still lying around to be used russia's access to the international financial system through swift more targeting of the personal wealth of putin and people around him uh, and also maybe a hope that some of this is personal to putin that's one of the theories i've seen put forward is that he may not have the entire Russian establishment behind him, that he personally clearly feels very strongly about this, but that if you kind of signal how how badly this would go for Russia in economic terms, there may be people he's sort of talking down. Uh, that that seems to be the hope. But I, yeah, I think it's the current, you know, just as everyone was talking about a possibility of a clash over Taiwan a couple of months ago, 
now this is 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 the issue and maybe the last thought i mean you know one theory is it's almost a sort of cry for attention from the russians who who as you know um very much resent the idea that they're no longer a great power and uh so one thought is perhaps if biden agrees to another summit with putin gives him face at least it's a way of prolonging the situation and avoiding an immediate crisis uh i think that's a a, a fair summary i uh of of, of the the heightened tension that we really have, and 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 I think everyone is is, is seeing, and 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 Nahal, uh, I am I continue to be struck, talking to people in Washington, how deeply worried they seem about the situation in a way that frankly was very different when the last buildup happened in April. Of course, Bill Burns was sent to Moscow as a as a signal. I think the language that Blinken used yesterday in Stockholm and that. Stoltenberg used in in, um, uh, in Riga at the end of the NATO Secretary General uh, Stoltenberg at the end of the NATO Foreign Minister meeting sort of signals a concern that's different uh, than uh, than uh, what are you picking up uh, uh, from folks in Washington? The, the exact same. I've actually been surprised at how uh, people that I don't think will get back to me have been getting back to me in a state of alarm about this. And I've just been like, wow, like that, you know, that really does suggest there's a lot of concern. Um, you know, I, I do think though there is still, you know, this possibility that some people are holding on to that Putin has not made up his mind yet as to exactly what he will do, whether he will green light another invasion or what. Um, my understanding from talking to someone familiar with the, the conversation between Blinken and Lavrov um, was that it was very grave that, you know, Blinken very made it very clear um, the steps that the U.S. was prepared to take and that Lavrov heard the message loud and clear, um, but Lavrov denied that there were any plans to invade. Um, now, again, that, that could be a technical thing, you know, like, well, there's no plans because Vladimir Putin hasn't signed that particular document or whatever. Um, but the thing that gets me is, look, yeah, look, in April, for instance, he what he did, Putin did send a bunch of soldiers and did build, do some building up around the border. Um, and then he pulled back a bit, but he didn't pull back entirely, right? And so the other thing I have to wonder is, okay, say Biden does talk to him as the two are expected to do, to do soon, and Putin reduces the number of forces again, you know, at the same time, I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't bring it down to like zero, if he leaves a significant amount there so that the tensions are always heightened. Um, the other thing to remember about this is that Putin plans to be in charge of Russia for like ever, right? I mean, I, much longer than Biden's going to be president. And so he, if he really believes he's going to stick around that long, like bringing Ukraine back into the fold to him might seem like a, an important legacy, you know, in, in history of his country and what he can do. Um, but it could also turn out to be a very, very risky and bad bet, a bloody bet. Um, and I don't know if that's the type of thing he wants to to do. Um, and I, I just, I think we're all sort of at the mercy right now of what's in Vladimir Putin's mind. Well, being at the mercy, uh, Nirmal, of Vladimir Putin's mind may not be the best for the future of, uh, of Ukraine or indeed of, of, of Russia. Uh, uh, Gideon mentioned the, um, uh, uh, the, the essay that Putin uh, wrote in July, I think, you know, his speech was pretty darn clear too about the red line of any sort of NATO involvement in Ukraine, well short of Ukrainian NATO membership to uh, military presence uh, in, uh, in, in Ukraine, which of course there is, uh, uh, as of today with the weapons and training and that's been going on for, for decades uh, in, in, in many ways. Um, uh, how, how do you read it and, 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 and what do you think uh, might dissuade him from taking military action? Uh, what kind of steps do you think might uh, uh, help uh, in order for him to say, maybe this is not where I want to be? Are there positive inducements, summits or, uh, or others? Are there, and what kind of negative steps uh, might be possible? Yeah, well, this is a little bit more uh, more in, in, in your lane, really, than mine. But I would say it's quite interesting because there is, uh, there is, it is developing into a test of NATO and U.S. credibility, right, which is being closely watched because there are some parallels with Taiwan. Not, not, it's not a close parallel, but there are some obvious parallels with Taiwan. So I think what uh, Nahal was saying, uh, uh, nobody wants us to start a war which they cannot win. 
and then they look bad, it goes bad for the economy and so forth. So that is really the key. I mean, how much pressure, how much blowback will uh, Putin get uh, if uh, he go goes on with this plan? He can easily, quite easily ratchet down a bit, reduce the troop numbers and so forth, but still mobilize very quickly sometime in the future if he wants to, right? That could, that could fairly easily be done. But uh, as of now, the last I heard was that there is a summit being planned between uh, Joe Biden and Putin, and you know maybe within a few weeks, before the end of the year perhaps, that would stretch things out a bit and maybe they can reach some sort of understanding then. But basically it boils down to whether, uh, what the cost is gonna to be to Putin to realize this sort of dream of his. And if he's gonna look bad, if everything's gonna go sideways, then uh, he, it might give him pause. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that, that, uh, that those are wise words, and if I, my sense is if you can raise the cost to Putin uh, and, and make clear what those, those costs are, which is really standing behind Ukraine defensively and militarily, uh, and then economically with sanctions, that, that the words that Blinken are using about high impact, very serious, severe consequences, uh, sort of point, point to the kind of measures that Gideon was talking about, and then offer to have some negotiation, some, some, some diplomatic engagement, whether that starts off with a meeting with Putin and, 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 and Biden, and then perhaps let, leads to a diplomatic strategy. Remember, the US has not been diplomatically engaged on Ukraine. This is a, a policy that uh, uh, two countries that you would have thought normally been engaged, the UK and the US, uh, both, both signatories with Russia of the famous memorandum uh, that, uh, uh, in Budapest that provided guarantees, not guarantees, that said that they would um, uh, unquestionably, uh, did not question the borders and the sovereignty and territorial integrity of, of Ukraine, which Russia also signed. Um, those two countries haven't been part of these negotiations and perhaps that's that's part of it, a carrot and stick uh, approach, but um, I can, we're all gonna be watching this very closely because clearly uh, tensions have risen to a level that uh, that has been uh, not seen since the last time there was, in, in effect, a military confrontation in 2014, uh, as Secretary Blinken keeps uh, keeps talking about. Um, we have a few minutes left, Nahal and and and, and uh, Gideon and Nirmal. Uh, Nirmal, let me start you with you, Nahal. Uh, next week, the Summit of the, for Democracies, long uh, uh, planned and announced by Biden, he campaigned on it. Uh, what can we expect uh, in this virtual meeting, which is uh, as is being promised, is the first. Uh, not the only uh, meeting to expect. Yeah, so first of all, it's the Summit for Democracy, not the Summit for Democracies or the Summit of Democracies, because, and that's really important because, you know, the, the way the administration is, is saying this is like, it's not just about creating some sort of a club of democracies. It's about promoting the strengthening and, and, and protection of the very concept of democracy. Uh, so it's basically two days of virtual meetings and a ton of side events. Um, you're going to have uh, participants from uh, around 110 governments. I use that word instead of countries because Taiwan is invited and, you know, you know how that goes. Um, and yeah, look, I think, you know, it's not quite what people wanted it to be originally. And I think that's partly because they wanted it to be in person, but the pandemic won't allow that. Um, they, they wanted more robust uh, involvement from civil society, but that's been tough. They, they just kind of been slow to get this together initially. But from what I can tell, they have really lined up a number of things. And there's going to be a bunch of announcements related to alliances, you know, in the field of technology and things like that. Um, and they're defining the concept of, you know, democracy, human rights, anti-corruption, these things pretty broadly. So I do think you're going to see a lot of people, uh, governments, uh, including the U.S., announcing you know, plans to do things in certain areas. Now, I think the key, though, is if they do follow through with these plans in the coming year, which they're calling a year of action, um, and if they do implement some of these initiatives, um, and then we'll know, like, at the end of next year when they're going to ho host the second Summit for, Demo Summit for Democracy uh, Part 2. Uh, so, yeah, I think it, I, I wouldn't rule it out as, you know, not going to be a success or whatever, but I, I do agree that, like, the virtual format makes it much more awkward and probably less fun than it could have been in person. Nirmal, you were in Singapore, uh, one of the countries not invited, uh, or one of the governments not invited. Uh, let me let me uh, put it exactly in that term. And how, how are people in Asia more generally uh, looking at this? Are they seeing this as 
uh, very much in the US China uh, competition uh, context? Are they or are they seeing this, uh, 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 you know, as the administration is trying to sell it as as a way to strengthen democratic forms of government at home and really a sort of an inward looking as opposed to an outward looking way uh, uh, by stressing it's not democracies, but democracy, as, as Nahal rightly uh, emphasized. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of countries in Asia, um, so they agree, of course, that uh, that uh, uh, the, the whole, the broad theme of strengthening democracy and democracy as a more resilient form of government and all that. Uh, they agree with all that, but they don't, they're allergic generally to being lectured on democracy by by others, especially Western powers. That, that's a longstanding thing. And some eyebrows have been raised by the fact that some countries are in and some are not. But as Nahal you know, pointed out, um, it's, it's a summit on democracy, not of democracies. So well, Singapore is not in, Thailand is not in, Malaysia is, uh, Malaysia is in, Philippines and Indonesia are in, Pakistan is in, but Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Bhutan are not in, which is, which is kind of strange. Now, Dan Crittenbrink, who is Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs, was in Singapore at a round table and he was asked about this and he acknowledged, he said, there's a range of countries, including some of our closest partners like Singapore who are not invited. But this is not a commentary on the strength of our partnership with Singapore. He described the summit as an opportunity for a quote unquote select number of US partners. So that sort of explains that somewhat. And um, I don't think the exclusions will actually, I don't think anything is going to affect the US's regional partnerships and alliances. Nothing is going to change overnight. I mean, the whole, as someone said, democracy, as we know, is, is a marathon exercise. One summit is not going to suddenly put everything in motion and, and, and rejuvenate uh, democracy, which has certainly been backsliding. And another problem over here is that the US is counted as one of those backsliding countries. And in fact, the majority, according to this, uh, I wrote about this, I think it was two, three months ago, a Pew survey of public opinion in developed countries and and america and across the board they found that a uh, majority of people actually don't think america is a good example of democracy anymore a, a lot a lot of them said it used to be but not in recent years so there's a huge credibility gap and you could argue that's why they should have the summit uh, but yeah it's a huge credibility gap all around and you know well we'll have to see this time next week you know what the result is and, and, and we will. Uh, but before we get there, Gideon, in, in Europe, what's the what's the view on this? Uh, I, I think there's presumably a shared sense that democratic backsliding is happening and it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but are the Europeans uh, and, and that includes, of course, in this case, also the British government, uh, look at this as an opportunity to really solidify their relationship or are they trying to go through the motion uh, as they are worried about other things? Well, I, I don't think it's got huge headlines here, but I think most Europeans would be reasonably well disposed to it, apart from one or two who haven't been invited. So, uh, you know, the Hungarians, for example, have not been invited and I think have been vocally displeased about it. They're not being sort of uh, cool about it, like the Singaporeans, because it clearly was a slap in the face and the polls are going and they, they too are accused of uh, backsliding. But I think in a, in a funny way, the fact that, uh, as we were hearing, it's been billed as a summit not of democracies but for democracy um, gets around some of the difficult issues about definitions you know why x and not y uh, and also the questions that we were hearing about well is the us in any position to lecture anymore given what what happened earlier this year and uh, the general sense of democracy isn't what it used to be in the united states so we're certainly been under challenge and i think that you know, when I was in Washington talking briefly about it to administration officials, I think that was their feeling was that they could present this as a with a bit more humility than they might have done in the past, saying, yeah, we too are troubled. And therefore, democracies, uh, governments that value this can get together and compare notes as much as America standing as the sort of shining city on the hill saying, if you're very lucky, you could get to be like us. You know, it's more like, well, even here, we've had our problems. Uh, but we are a group of countries or governments that, that believe in democracy as a concept and can exchange notes and support each other. 
Um, and yes, of course, there is this anti-China, anti-Russia agenda behind it as well. But I think um, in a funny way, you could have abandoned it saying this is just too complicated definitionally and given what's happened in America. And I think they've done a bit of sco rather skillful repositioning uh, to give it some kind of relevance for the times we're in. Yeah, and I think I think that's right. Uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, uh, Nahal, yeah, jump in for your last minute. Yeah, um, one of one of the interesting things to me was, um, you know, it really does show the testament of the, to the power that the United States still has, though, uh, in terms of inviting people and convening things, because um, China and Russia are pretty upset about this. Uh, yeah. They could have said nothing, you know, and just ignored it, but instead, their ambassadors wrote a an op-ed in the national interest decrying the whole thing, uh, saying who is the U.S. to define what you know counts as a democracy, and they insisted that China and and Russia were both democracies, and it was really something fascinating to read. Um, but it really was like wow. So so clearly, simply the fact that the U.S. is doing this is getting under their skin, uh, and I know for a fact that people in the administration were quite happy to see that. Yeah, and, and, and maybe next time they should invite the Democratic uh, People's Republic of Korea to sign on to that uh, op-ed as well uh, when, when we get to that. Uh, interesting. I, I, I was going to note exactly that. Uh, it, it did get under their skin. Uh, but I, do, I, I also think the point that everyone has stretched is really important. In contrast to all the previous ones, whether it was the community of democracies and everything else that we've had, which was really about promoting uh, democracy, particularly among those who aren't, this is really about defending democracy and, and trying to reform it and strengthening it at home uh, from those who are uh, and understanding the, the flaws that all of, a, all of us in one form or another have. And I think coming in that sense, coming from the administration uh, and, and this inward looking sense of uh, focus on democracy and, and how it is being uh, 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 attacked from within. Uh, is as important as trying to make this a contradistinction with uh, countries like, like Russia and China. We'll see how it all uh, plays out uh, virtually uh, next week, and we'll be back next week for another uh, round of discussion of news around the world, and we'll discuss what, what in fact came out of the Summit for Democracy. Uh, for this week, I want to thank uh, Nahal Tusi, uh, Nirmal Ghosh, and of course, Gideon Rockman for joining us and for all of you for joining us for uh, this week's edition of World Review. We wish you all a great weekend, and we'll be back next week with another edition of World Review. Thank you all.